In this video, we're going to continue our investigation of recursion by analyzing a famously recursive function. This is going to be binary search. This function will take as input a sorted array A, then two indices in that array, I and J, that correspond to the range of indices we will be searching, and then a value K, which we are looking for within the array. How do we do this? Well, we know the array is sorted, so we're just going to check whether we find the value in the middle. If it's not in the middle, it's got to be on either side of it. And based on whether or not the value we are looking for is larger than the value in the middle or less than the value of the middle, we will make a decision. So let's see how that works. We look here, we find the midpoint. We then check, is the midpoint value equal to the value we're searching for? If so, we are done. If the value we're searching for is less than the midpoint value, we need to search in the beginning of the array. And if the value is bigger than the midpoint value, then we need to search in the second half of the array. We then return whatever index we find. Let's begin by identifying that this has a problem where we don't have a good notion for size yet. So we're going to need to define what we mean by the size of the array. So let's define that. We're going to let n equal j minus i plus 1. This is a common technique when you're analyzing algorithms that are searching within a range and don't necessarily search from 1 to n. We'll usually start with something like this. Let's see what everything costs. Looking at everything that's not recursive, we have an assignment, if statements, assignments, and a return. Everything that's not recursive that takes constant time. So let's then decide how large are the recursive calls. And this is where we might get into some hesitation, where we go, hold on, we have two different options for our recursive call, and it will only ever do one of them. So what we're going to do, instead of trying to analyze all of the possibilities for what it could do, we're just going to analyze the worst case runtime. Worst case runtime of the algorithm. What that means is we're always going to assume that we make the worst possible decision. This is an example of an algorithm where ignoring the floor might actually cause a problem if we're trying to be precise. So we're actually going to spend a lot of time here verifying what's going on. So let us figure out the sizes of our recursive calls. The first one there. size one, I'll call it, for if it is on the left-hand side, is equal to. My value for the size was the second bound minus the first bound plus one. So this would be mid p minus one minus the first bound plus one. We get some very nice cancellation there. We get that the size of that first recursive call is mid p minus i, because the plus one and the minus one cancel. Similarly, size two from the second possible recursive call, the top bound is j minus mid p plus one quantity, and then plus one. And again, we get some nice cancellation. We get j minus mid p. Now we want to try to take into account that floor function that we are applying to the arithmetic performed above. So how can we do that? Well, there are two options. Either that floor function evaluates to an integer before it even, or sorry, that floor function always evaluates to an integer. Either it was originally an integer or it was a half more than an integer. So we have two options. We have two cases. Either the midpoint is equal to i plus j over 2. That happens when i plus j results in an even value, and then therefore when we divide by 2, we still be, remain an integer. Or we need that i plus j over 2 is not an integer. 
it is a half more than an integer. So when we round it down, we take it down by a half. So those are our two options. So let's investigate what happens with our two options. Size one is equal to, maybe we give ourselves more space here, two possibilities. Let's look at the first one, when mid p equals i plus j over 2. Minus i. And then the second option, which is i plus j over 2 minus a half minus i. This equals our two options. We actually get some really nice cancellation here. i over 2 minus i is negative i over 2. So the top one would be j minus i all over 2. The bottom one would be the same thing, just minus a half. So we have j minus i minus 1 all over 2. Those are our options for the size 1. Now, let's look at size 2. It's equal to. Let's do the same thing j minus i plus j over 2, or j minus i plus j over 2 minus a half. Let's do some simplification. The first one, we keep an i over 2. We have j minus j over 2. That will be j over 2. So j minus i all over 2. For the next one, we have the exact same thing, but we're adding on a half. So we have j minus i plus 1 over 2. So for the size of the recursive calls, we have three options. I will mark them here in a light blue. We have option one, option two, this is option one again, and then option three. Remember, I said we're going to look for the worst case running time. So we want to identify which one of these options for the sizes of a recursive call is the largest. We have a j minus i, j minus i minus one, that's smaller than the first option, and then j minus i plus one. The worst case runtime option is this one down here. Option three. And something else convenient happens with option three. J minus i plus one should look really familiar from the start of the problem where we said that is exactly what we defined n to be. So the worst case size of a recursive call would be n over two. So my recurrence relation will be t of n is equal to, I said everything takes constant time, plus t of n over 2. Remember, this is the worst case. Now we need to identify the base case. The base case here is a bit annoying because of the way that we do integer division. Our base case is actually that we have an array of size 0, which by continually dividing by 2, we will actually never arrive at. So our base case will actually be t of 1, because we will then make one more recursive call and then terminate. So even though directly looking at the sizes in the function, it would be 0 for convenience we're going to say it's t of 1. Again because of the integer division once it hits 1, 1 divided by 2 rounded down gives us 0. So we're actually off by 1 here but it's not going to affect anything. If you want you can add in that additional run one iteration at the end to be exact. Now let's power through our substitutions. t of n equals c plus make a substitution of n over 2 and we get c plus t of n over 2 over 2, which is n over 2 squared, this equals 2c plus t of n over 2 squared. 
let's do another substitution. T of n equals 2c plus make another substitution, and we get another copy of c, plus t of n over 2 squared divided by 2. That's n over 2 cubed. So t of n equals 3c plus t of n over 2 cubed. My original expression, I had c plus n over 2, then 2c over n over 2 squared, and then 3c over, th sorry, 3c plus t of n over 2 cubed. So generically, I have t of n is equal to k times c plus t of n over 2 to the k. Now, I simply need to find the value of k. So we want that n over 2 to the k should equal our base case, which is 1. So k equals log base 2 of n. Now, t of n equals log base 2 of n times c plus n over 2 to the k is equal to 1. So t of n over 2 to the k is t of 1, which is just c. So t of n, so t of n must be in theta of log of n. So this binary search in the worst case is in theta of log of n, which is somewhat encouraging because that is a relatively good runtime to have. It did involve a lot of work to verify that we were doing things correctly. This can happen sometimes when you're looking for a worst case runtime and trying to verify which of the possible sizes is the